Why can't I hear music play? My world is changing. I'm rearranging. Does that mean Christmas changes too? Today's scripture is from Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 through 5. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus asking, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? So Jesus called the child to come out and stand in front of them and said, I assure you that unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. The greatest in the kingdom of heaven is the one who humbles himself and becomes like this child. And whoever welcomes in my name one such child as this welcomes me. Let's give our scripture reader a hand, please. The, uh, there's a rule that you never get on stage with a child. I have failed on three different accounts already this morning, so... Uh, it's going to be a challenge to recover from that, but I'm sure the Lord will be faithful. Would you just bow your heads in prayer, please? Heavenly Father, we say thank you. Thank you for every one of these Bethel kids that we've seen sing, sing solos, read the scripture, dance on the stage. Show us the full extent of their joy and their jubilance, Father God. It's amazing to watch these little ones and how much energy that they have and, and excitement just for life. And I pray that as we go over today's scripture, that we will remember, Father God, what that's like and, and that you will take us back so that we too can have the heart of a child and receive the kingdom of God like these little ones. I pray this today. I believe this today in Jesus' holy and precious name. And together everyone says, Amen. Amen. We uh, are concluding a series that we have affectionately termed Grinched. Uh, today's message is the heart of the child, and, and, and really it's the perfect wrap-up of this series, because what we've been trying to communicate for, for four weeks now is that when God came through the person of Jesus Christ, that he brought with himself gifts. 
that he wants you to have peace on earth. He wants you to have goodwill towards men. He wants you to have joy to the world. He wants you to be content and and have a level of happiness and success and, and those different kinds of things in your life. But the devil comes along and scripture describes him in, in John chapter 10, verse 10, as the thief. And he comes to steal. Say steal. He comes to steal and to kill and destroy. And, and that's why we're kind of identifying him with this, this Grinch character. There's that, that song that, how many of you grew up with the Grinch movie? Anybody here? I, I mean, I'm talking about the original cartoon that's only 25 minutes long. And uh, that, that iconic voice of the guy who sang, that, you're a mean one. I, I can't even get that low. Can, can, I don't know if anyone can. Mr. Grinch, you know, just that deep voice. But, but listen to some of the first lines. You really are a heel. You're as cuddly as a cactus. You're as charming as an eel, Mr. Grinch. You're a bad banana with a greasy black peel. You're a monster, Mr. Grinch. Your heart's an empty hole. And because the devil literally has this crushed down, broken heart, he tries to make sure that every human being that has been made in the image of God is also crushed, broken down, disappointed in life. So he tries to steal your joy from childhood. He tries to take away your peace uh, through the Christmas season. He tries to to remove and destroy your family and to, to take away your dreams for life and all of those kinds of things. And from my vantage point, He's doing a really, really good job in the world in which we live. And so we're trying to to get back to to that place where we can actually experience the joy of Christmas, the peace of Christmas, the contentment of Christmas. So in this chapter, Matthew chapter 18, the, the disciples show up and they begin talking to one another and then they say to Jesus, Jesus, which of us, basically is what they're asking, but, but who's the greatest in your kingdom? And Jesus pulls a sneaky one on him. He grabs a little child, and if you're familiar with the scriptures, both in Matthew, Mark, and in Luke, uh, most of them are infants, but there's probably a couple of twos and threes and maybe even some four-year-olds in the lot that he's going to about to bless, and he grabs one of them, one of them that can stand, and he sets this little kid right in the middle of him, and he says, he says, unless you change, say change, unless you change and become like this little child, you can never enter into the kingdom of God. When I I think about that, I'm thinking about the the little five-year-old that's staying at my house right now and and how energetic he is, how crazy he is, how over the top and, and, and curious he is. And I begin to think of all of my grandchildren and the children that I had when they were younger and their, their, their inquisitiveness, their heart of, of curiosity, where they're always, always exploring. They're always getting into something. And so that since this service focuses on kids so much, I brought some pictures of my grandkids. I've got uh, Tanner here. Oh, he's my little six-month-old. And uh, Tanner showed up on Friday morning because some of us were going to play basketball here at the uh, church on Friday morning. And so my son drove down from Dublin and and brought Tanner along with him. And Robin agreed to watch four of our grandkids ages five, three, six months, and four months. (laughs) All at once. And I knew this was going to be a challenge immediately when Trevor comes and he lays uh, Tanner down on the ground and he starts scooting. He doesn't crawl. He he kind of does this uh, military crawl and he starts scooting across the floor like this. And he goes immediately after a Christmas tree. He goes after decorations. Robin forgot what it was like to have little ones in the house. She decorated the house for adults and there's stuff for the little kids to get into. And so she started protecting everything by moving the couches strategically in front of trees and decorations and and different things like that. Well, Ryan is my five-year-old who's staying with us, and and this is what Ryan looks like right here, and he's eating a cookie, which is no surprise. He's always eating cookies. Now, now Ryan is already getting out of that that 
preschool type age. He just turned five. And because he's five, he's a little bit smarter, a little bit more sly when it comes to his exploration. So what Ryan does, and uh, I saw him do this yesterday. He didn't even know I was watching. He, he kind of walked down over to the Christmas tree, and he's kind of uh, scoping out the presents. <laughs> and you know what he's doing, right? He's looking for one for himself. And uh, he sees one for his sister, and he just kind of kicks that one over to the side. And, uh, you know, he, he moves on in, and he sees one with his name on it. And he's kind of like over the right shoulder and over the left shoulder, and he reaches down and he grabs this Christmas present. And you know what he's looking for, right? He's looking for something that has some weight to it, because if it's too soft and smushy, it's clothes. And he doesn't want clothes, you know. He wants something fun. He wants a toy, a game, a video game, something that he gets to play with. And, and so he starts shaking this thing and, and, and listening to it. That's what a child is. They're, they're curious. They're looking for things. Now, his sister is always asking questions. She cannot get enough. It was raining. She's like, Papa, where does the rain come from? And I go, well, it comes from the clouds. Well, Papa, where do the clouds come from? Well, it comes from the ocean. Papa, where does the ocean come from? Well, it comes from God. Well, well, Papa, where does God come from? Well, God doesn't come from anywhere. And she's just stunned. You know, it's like, God doesn't come from anywhere. Everything comes from somewhere, you know? And, and so I'm trying to explain that to her. These kids are innocent on all of this, but that's not how the disciples are approaching life. The disciples are, are coming to Jesus and, and, and kind of with their arms crossed are saying, uh, who's the greatest in the kingdom? As if they've done everything as if they've experienced everything, as if they, they really know what, what God is even interested in. They're, they're, they're trying to impress Jesus with their religiosity and, and their holiness and their command of Scripture, but, but all they're doing is putting their pride, say pride, they're putting their pride on display. They're competing with one another and comparing and jockeying and debating and arguing and saying, who's the greatest? And, and there's no doubt in my mind that, that, that Peter is sitting there thinking, I know it's me. So say me, Jesus. I know it's me. Thomas is going, oh no, it's me. It's me. And, and James and John, they didn't even have the guts to ask Jesus. They got their mommy to come and do it and, and to ask, and would you put one of my sons on your right hand and one on the left hand? And Jesus is saying, you guys, you, you've got it all wrong. You've got to understand there's got to be some curiosity, some humility in you. you, you you've got to be amazed with every single new day that I give you. My newest grandchild is Reagan. And uh, she's amazed by literally everything. And uh, this is uh, Ryan and Rosie's little sister. And uh, yesterday she was laying on this, on this cloth or on this blanket on the floor and uh, I thought I was going to have a heart attack as her older brother runs across the room, leaps over her. And I'm like, no, 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 you can't do that. So as Papa, I get down on the blanket with her and I'm trying to get her attention when I realize she's already completely fascinated by her own hand. And she's staring at this thing and turning it back and forth and, and, and looking at it. And, and I'm saying, Reagan, look at me, look at me, look at me. She's fascinated by her hand. And I'm thinking, you know what, this reminds me of David in Psalm 139. In Psalm 139, he says, how marvelously, how, how curiously, how, how miraculously have I been created. And he's having this, this childlike moment. And, and, and I started thinking, wow, I am, I am marvelously made. I have got, I've got 10 fingers and I've got two hands and, and, and all of the parts are, are working for the most part, even at my advanced age. And that's enough to praise the Lord for right there in and in of itself. And, and, and I'm having a, a ragged moment, you might say. And, and, and it, since my youngest son is here, Trent, would you just wave? That's my youngest son. Would you give him a hand, please? <clears throat> He's uh, living in Las Vegas right now, just recently graduated from college. If anyone has a job, he needs a job. So would you please, please help, help me out a little bit here? But I remember him when he was, I think he was three years of age, and we were driving through the, uh, the state of Utah, and uh, yeah, that was him, that was him when he, when he was cute, now he's big and ugly, so, uh, <laughs> so um, that's about how old he was, and we're driving through Utah, and all of a sudden he yells, look at that, 
And we're like thinking, what is it? And we turn, and there's nothing over there, just mountains everywhere. Because that's what Utah has, is mountains. And he says, look at that mountain. And we're just like, well, which one? And he says, that one. And, and we're, we pretend we know what he's talking about, because we really don't know what he's talking about. Five minutes later, he does it again. And he does it for two straight hours. He's amazed at every cacti. He's amazed at every animal that runs across the road. Every sign that announces a dinosaur park that's coming up. And, and he's just amazed by everything. Listen to what Lamentation says that our God has for us. This is in chapter 3, verses 22 and 23. The Lord's love never ends. His mercies, say mercies. His mercies never stop. They are new every morning. I, I'm sitting here thinking sometimes my heart gets so hard. I get so set in my ways. I, I don't even realize how limited my experience really is. And I need to allow God to surprise me with something new this Christmas season. Who can say amen to that? He's got something for each and every one of us, something new. And in order for us to, to, to find out what these things are, Matthew 18, 4 says that, that the greatest in the kingdom of heaven is the one who humbles himself and becomes like a little child. So now, first Jesus grabs the kid and says, you have to become like the kid. Then he says, the characteristic or the trait that I want you to most resemble, the one I want you to most act upon is this heart of humility. The disciples jump on the scene and they're saying, hey, hey, Jesus, which is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus says, you guys are asking the wrong question. Put on the brakes. You're going the wrong way. It's not about a race to the top. It's actually a race to the bottom. And Jesus put his money where his mouth is by setting the perfect example. Look at what it says in Philippians 2, 5 through 8. You must have the same attitude that Jesus Christ had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Now, this week while I was meditating upon this scripture, I started thinking about who Jesus really is. I started thinking about all of his titles in, in, in the Bible. He's, he's the Prince of Peace. He's the Everlasting Father. He's the, the Mighty God. He's the Wonderful Counselor. He's known as the Ancient of Days. He's known as the one who was with God at the beginning and, and, and was there at creation. He is, he is the Creator Himself. He is the All-Powerful One, the All-Knowing One, the, the Almighty One. He possesses all riches and all glory and all honor and all of this stuff. And He could have come into this world any way he chose. He could have come as a king. He could have come as a conqueror. But he decided to come as a baby. So when Jesus says, unless you become like a child, do you understand that's exactly what Jesus did? He became literally a child for you and for me. The greatest in the universe became a lowly child to help us to understand how we enter into this particular kingdom. Jesus gave up all of his might and authority and all of that stuff, and he became totally and completely dependent on the Father. Look at verse 6 again. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. I don't know about you, but I have this saying in my life, it's hard to go backwards. Once you attain something, once you achieve something, it's hard to go back. Jesus was at the top of the totem pole, and he decided to become a human being. The scripture says in verse 7 that he gave up his privileges. He gave up his rights. He gave up the right to call the shots in his own life. He allowed God to dictate absolutely everything. He made himself needy. He made himself vulnerable when he didn't need to do it. And in verse 7, it says he became a human being. And when I look at that scripture, I realize that Jesus is showing his ultimate love and his ultimate acceptance for humanity by becoming a man himself. 
There are some who actually say that the world or the earth would be a better place without human beings. But God declares by sending his son Jesus Christ that you and I are the ultimate creation of our God. Who can say amen to that? We're at the top of the list. He loves us. He accepts us. Jesus humbled himself by obeying the Father. And he obeyed him by sacrificing, humbly sacrificing his life for other people. So Jesus set this beautiful example of humility, and now he stands before his disciples, and he says, says, now I want you to humble yourself in the same way. I want you to humble yourself like, like one of these children. Now, that's contrary to the Roman mindset, to the culture of the day, where, where children were nothing more than property. They, they had no rights, no power, no standing in the community. They, they, had, they had no ability to even speak for themselves. But as we've said before, children in their innocent state, they're, they're closer to the original design of man than most adults are. It's life that hardens us. It's the difficulties and discouragements and disappointments that that begin to take the wind out of the sail and the joy and the peace out of our lives. But let's think about a child just for a couple of moments as we begin to wrap things up here. Number one, kids are completely dependent on their parents. So, So God is saying the same way that a child is dependent on mom and dad, you should be completely dependent on me. You should trust me with absolutely everything. I think of a little kid when they get lost in the mall. Do do they go, "Mm, let's see, I'm lost in the mall. Let's see, Uh, um, I'm going to retrace my steps. Uh, I got to find somebody before I get embarrassed. No, they start crying right then and there. I want my mommy. They let the entire world know they're not embarrassed in any way, shape, or form. They, They don't care that they're dependent. They're made to be dependent on mom and dad. They have no pride. It's it's all humility for the world to see. Now, we, on the other hand, are quite different than that. I remember moving to the Bay Area back in 1985, and um, I'm from South Dakota. And in South Dakota, the town I grew up in, it was gigantic. It had 25,000 people in it. We had like 13 stoplights in the entire town. And so it was almost impossible to get lost there. So I'm in the Bay Area, and Robin's driving with me, and I'm completely lost. And Robin says, are you lost? And I go, no. (laughs) Do you need to stop and ask for directions? I go, no. I mean, the moment she said, ask for directions, my pride just, it's like, do you not understand I'm a man? I never ask for directions. I know what I'm doing. And, 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 and so all I'm doing is I'm praying, Lord, help me see just one thing that I recognize here before I have to admit to my wife that I'm wrong. A couple of years later, we're driving to South Dakota to see my, my mom and dad for Christmas. And uh, we're driving through the great state of Wyoming, and it's about 25 below zero. It's, uh, it's Christmas break and everything, and I've got a four-year-old and a newborn in the back seat. And, and we're heading there, and uh, uh, I'm thinking in my mind, I should pull over and get some gas. Well, my wife says, do you think you should pull over and get some gas? And I immediately go, no. Why? Because it can't be her idea, all right? It's got to be my idea. And, and, and so I know that there's another gas station just maybe 10 miles away, and, and so maybe 20 miles. So, so I make it to the next gas station, and by the sweat of my brow, I pull on in, and the gas station is closed. So I get back on the road, as any man would do, and uh, my wife goes, are you sure we can make it to the next gas station? I go, sure, no problem, trust me. And about five miles down the road, it says next gas stop 45 miles away. I'm already close to empty. And I'm like, what in the world am I doing? I'm going to kill my children. I'm not saying this verbally, okay? This is going through my mind. But I cannot admit that I could have made a mistake because of pride. And so I'm driving and driving and driving. And I get to the E. And then all of a sudden it starts going below the E. And finally I make it the 45 miles. And all I can tell you is I'm really grateful that the exit was downhill. Because when I got to the very top of that exit, I could tell the car was running out of gas. 
and I coasted on down that hill, went right through the stop sign because I saw the gas station right there. I made it to the gas station and my 12 gallon tank took 12.3 gallons. And I looked at my wife and I said, I told you we had enough gas. <laughs> that is the wrong way to live. That is pride. God says we need to be like children. Kids are not embarrassed to admit that they have needs, that they need direction, that they need provision. All of my grandchildren woke up this morning and they expected us to provide them with breakfast. They said that they were hungry, that they were thirsty, and they were not embarrassed by that. I, I had children, when I was talking to people in church, they would come and they would sit in my lap. They would grab my leg because they were not ashamed of needing the love that I provided them on a regular their basis. When it comes to security, Deuteronomy chapter 1 verse 31 says this, and in the desert you saw how the Lord your God carried you like one carries a child. My dad's here today too. Dad, would you wave? Give my dad a hand. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we had a, a place we would go once in a while, uh, Elaine and Al's house. And Elaine and Al had a farm in Pierce, South Dakota. If anybody knows where that is, that's a miracle in and of itself. But they had this farm that we would travel to, and sometimes we would go there early in the morning and we'd come back late at night, okay? And uh, we'd leave sometimes 9, 10 o'clock at night, and it would be an hour and a half, two hour drive to, to get back home, depending upon the weather situation. And one of the things that I would love to do is I'd love to pretend I was sleeping, because even if I wasn't really sleeping, I knew if I acted like I was asleep, my dad would pick me up. And he would carry me on into my bed, pull up the covers, put me in there, and I wouldn't have to do anything. I would just feel safe and secure. Dad, would you carry me right now, please? <laughs> <laughs> What's your greatest need? We'd probably say, I need some more money, or I need a better marriage, or I need to put my family back together, or I need my, whatever it is. But in order to really know the answer to that question, what is your greatest need? You have to realize, why did Jesus come to this planet? We celebrate Christmas, and we sing all these Christmas carols, and, and sometimes the words are, are kind of old and antiquated, and we're not even quite sure what they completely mean. So, so we really need to ask the question, why did Jesus come to this planet? And the answer is in Philippians chapter 2, verse 8, where it says, He humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. In other words, God wanted him to come to this planet, and God wanted him to die. Now, that doesn't sound like a, a Merry Christmas story, does it? Not on the surface. But I'm here to tell you, it is literally the greatest news the world has ever heard. Because Romans chapter 6 tells us that the wages of sin is death. Now, we know Jesus never died. And so he was crucified unjustifiably so. So he must have gone to that cross for a reason. And the reason is, is because you and I have sinned. One person is honest in this entire church. <laughs> Say amen. amen. We've all sinned. Every one of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And, and for some reason, people in America believe that there's a naughty and a nice list when it comes to Christianity. And there is not. Everybody, everybody, everybody is on the naughty list. Did you know that? And the only way to get to the nice list is if someone pays your price, and that's exactly what Jesus Christ did. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so that little baby in a manger represents a sacrifice that both he and the Father are going to make for all, say all, for all of humanity. But let me ask you something. If I was to buy you a ticket to Disneyland today and give it to you, but you never went to Disneyland, 
would it do you any good at all? No. God bought a ticket to the kingdom of heaven for everybody. But you must receive the ticket that he's given you. You have to accept it. You have to receive it. You have to take ownership of it. And again, the only way you do that is as a child. Look at Mark chapter 10, verse 15. This is our last point. I can guarantee this truth. Whoever does not receive God's kingdom as a little child receives it will never enter it. In other words, the kingdom of heaven is something that you receive and it is something that you enter into. It's something that you begin to participate in. It's something that you begin to take advantage of. It's something that you live in beginning the moment you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. So we need to have a heart of receptivity. And and in order to do that like a child, we have to receive God's gift with some excitement. And if you've forgotten what that's like, watch this little boy opening up a Christmas present. I can't even imagine what that was, can you? I mean, that had to have been literally the greatest gift the world has ever seen in the history of all humanity. As excited as he was, and it was a video game console, that's it. That's the kind of excitement and enthusiasm that we should have if we really understand what it is that God is giving to us. We need to open up the Christmas card. It's the Word of God. This is the Lord's Christmas card to you. And and you know, there's something about Christmas cards. If you get a lot of them, you might not appreciate them. Or if you've been getting them for a lot of years, you might think, oh, the same old message, same old message. And so what do you do? You open it up, you look who signs it, you close it, and you just put it on the side. There are words in most, most Christmas cards, right? We should read what the heart's intent of the author of that card or or the, the sender of that card was. If you don't read this book, you don't know the, the intent of the author. This is his Christmas card to us. And, and he's got so many glorious things that are in here. And, and then we can start ripping open the gift of the kingdom of heaven and see all of the great surprises that God has for us each and every, say every, every day. I wrote down that children receive graciously. And what I meant by that was there was no false humility at all. In other words, I've never heard a child say, oh, you shouldn't have done that. Right? They just receive. They receive graciously. They're, 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 they're appreciative. They, they, they want what it is that you're going to give them. And they don't put on any airs or anything like that. They, they just take it. And children receive expectantly. I, I was at the mall, and I saw these kids sitting on Santa's lap. And I started imagining what was going through their minds. And all I could think was, those kids are confident. You could see it in their eyes. Santa, I, I, I want this, I want this, I want this. They get off the Santa's lap, and they start heading to mom and dad thinking, I've got it, it's in the bag. There was, there was no doubts in their minds. They weren't getting off Santa's lap going, now don't forget me, I'm at 1300, you know, whatever the address is. They knew Santa knew where they were at. They, they knew all of that stuff. But Santa's not real, but God is. Okay? And this is what the scripture says in, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. Ask, and it will be given you. When we ask like a child, what we're saying is, I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that God is exactly who he says he is. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe that he died for my sins and for the sin of the world. And I believe there's more to this gift than salvation. 
If there's one thing I could tell a, a church that has people who've been Christians for over five years is Christianity is about more than getting to heaven someday. It's about fullness of life. It's about an abundant life. The joy and the peace and the contentment that we've talked about for the last three weeks isn't something that we're going to get someday when we get to heaven. Oh, sure, we'll get it then. But eternal life begins the moment you get saved. The moment you say to God, I'm sorry for my sins. I want to change my ways. I want to become one of your children. That's when you are endued, filled with eternal life. Now, that doesn't mean you're living that way. You can live a completely different way. You can live contrary to the spirit who resides inside of you. You can live in perpetual doubt and, and still get into heaven, as they say, by the skin of your teeth. But you don't need to live that way. So what I recommend is that you keep asking. You keep asking, you keep asking, you keep asking. I have another child who's going to be here this weekend for Christmas, and his name is, is Trevor. And there's Trevor as a, I think he's 12 years old right there, maybe, maybe 11 years old. And uh, that's the first dog that I ever purchased because I made a promise to myself that I would never own a dog. Not because I don't like dogs, I love dogs, but because we had four children and I didn't need another child in the house. They're hard to raise. And, and you moms and dads know what I'm talking about. So, so, so I think... My son at the age of three asked me for a dog, and I, I just said, no, we, we can't have a dog. It's too much for our family. And so he asked at the age of four, can I have a dog? And I said, I said no, a dog's too much for us. And at five, six, and seven, he asked again, and I said, no, 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 again. And at eight, nine, and ten, he asked again, and I said, no, 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 again. And, and finally, his mother and he conspired against me. That's really what happened. Because my oldest son went into the Marines, and Robin comes up to me and says, you know what? Your son has been so persistent. You should reward him and it won't be any more work because we're losing one kid and now we're getting another. <laughs> so I broke down and we bought Webster. That was Webster right there. But he just, I'll never forget his persistence. I'll never forget that he, he never complained to me. He might have complained to his brother, I don't know. But he never got angry, never got upset, never became a baby. He just, every Christmas, can have a dog, can have a dog. Maybe you just haven't asked enough. Maybe you haven't got the revelation that God has for you, but there is more to this Christian life than salvation. Salvation's great. It's, we, we have to have that, but there's joy and peace and contentment too. Would you stand with me, please? Would you bow your heads? Two simple questions. If you need to receive Jesus into your life today, would you just raise your hand and say, Pastor, that's me. I need Jesus Christ as my Savior. I need to accept the gift of Jesus Christ. I saw one hand. Anybody else? Two, three? Sure. You guys can put your hands down. Thanks. If, if you want one of the Lord's new mercies, and uh, you've been a Christian for a while, and it's, it, it's just kind of run its course. You're not completely where you, you think you should be. And after hearing the messages this month, you're, you know you're missing something. And if you need one of God's new mercies, would you just raise your hand and say, Pastor, remember me in prayer. I, I need those new mercies today in Jesus' name. Thank you, guys. You can put your hands down. Heavenly Father, it's a privilege to pastor any group of people. And I'm thankful for the men and women of Bethel. I'm thankful for those who've been here for many, many years, Father God. And I'm thankful for the newcomers. I'm asking you to do a, a work here that is beyond my ability as a human being. I'm asking you to send your spirit, your son, literally into the hearts of people who've never accepted you before as Lord and Savior. I saw a few hands raised across this sanctuary and they might be wondering, how is this even possible? And the Bible says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's as simple as that. So I pray that this revelation will be acknowledged in the hearts of all those who raise their hand and even those who, who thought about raising their hand today in Jesus' name. 
And now I pray, Father God, for the rest of us. There is so much more in the kingdom of God. And I pray that you would allow us to, to look at your kingdom and your Christmas and your giftings, Father God, through the eyes of a child. I pray that we wouldn't think we've been there and done that and there's nothing you can do to surprise us. I pray that, that we would take on the eyes of innocence and curiosity and humility and, and an excitement, Father God, to receive something special from you this Christmas holiday season. Father God, make it so. And I declare with the words of, of Mary, do it unto me, do it unto us according to your word. I pray this today in Jesus' holy and precious name. And together everyone says, amen. God bless you guys.